Hey everyone, how are you? I wanted to take some time today to uh, go through some of the expectations and criteria for Project 3 since you're um, wrapping it up. And so I've given you the rubric. In the past, you have the handout, you have the resources page, you've met with me or many of you have or you're scheduled to meet with me to discuss your argument. And I just wanted to, uh, we're gonna go blue, <laughs> um, follow up with a video. And this is gonna be the notes for the video. Uh, if we were in person in class while I talked um, during class and demonstrated things and showed you things, I would also be typing away. I find that very helpful for both visual learners and kinesthetic learners to be able to see the typing go and it helps with focus. So we are gonna do that here as well. So the first thing I wanna show you is the project, project three. The criteria included, here it is, a choice of four different topics, an opportunity to examine those, develop your claim, and that ultimately it would be um, a four-page paper, probably 1,100 to 1,400 words, at least three sources. One of them has to be um, in a peer-reviewed article, and you want to make sure that all of your sources are reliable, verifiable, timely, and correct. Research changes over time, and while some fields change more quickly, um, you know, for example, technology fields can change from day to day, whereas the study of Shakespeare might not change from as significantly from decade to decade. So you want to make sure, though, for the topics that we have listed, that you are working with um, current fields, because the psychological recess, the physiological recess research, um, early college, that's changing every day. The research on early college is coming in and growing. The ideas of doing nothing will involve cognitive sciences and should college be free, lots of new policy and all sorts of things going on there. So you want to make sure that your sources are timely. You also want to make sure that you have completed the plagiarism tutorial and that you are following MLA format. Now, one of the things that I wanted to also, while we take a look at this link, I want to show you the sample paper so that you can take a look at the guidelines. It'll give you um, just a really good discussion of what a um, college paper in MLA format looks like. In the green here is information about writing. What is most helpful, in my opinion, on this example is the blue, because it talks to you about how your paper should look. And one of the first things that a teacher does when they open the paper is to see if those basic criteria have been followed. So I'm going to drop that into the notes. This is um, MLA citation information. And um, this is sample MLA paper. And of course, the plagiarism tutorial. I have another video that I made for you uh, that goes through the different questions that were asked that you can watch as well. So those are three of the basics that we're just um, going to put out there for right now. Uh, ultimately, what you want to know is as much as everyone is in the class to learn to be a better writer, right? That's the way it is. Um, Y'all want to know what your grade's going to be on the paper can't tell you what that'll be until we read it and evaluate and go um, through it, but the way to find out how your papers can be assessed can give you some information. 
what I find is people generally recognize an A paper. They know that um, someone, they have gotten it, that their classmate has gotten it, <clears throat> excuse me, that things are done really beautifully. Um, they also know when they didn't meet expectations. So those D papers or failing papers are also pretty clear. What becomes kind of questioned is where is a C, what is average, where is a B, what is good versus what is an A, which is excellent, right? So when you think about these things, take a look at this. We have, um, let me see if I can reduce this a little bit so we can see the whole thing. Okay, so it still doesn't want to show, there we go. All right, sorry, this is tiny, but you can see all of the criteria that I am going to be assessing for. Now in upper division and um, classes, no one's gonna give you points or credit for MLA documentation being correct and mechanics being correct. They're going to expect it to be correct. But since we're learning those things, those do contribute to your grade. Now it's not that you can't have A, excellent, you can't have excellent ideas, but if they're not presented with um, correct structures, then there's problems with clarity. So you can never have an A paper that misses um, these two areas, the MLA documentation and the mechanics. Those are a must have for an A paper. Also for a B paper. There will be some issues, um, maybe in a C paper, that people are working on. But when you think about grammar and mechanics, or even citing sources, um, especially grammar and mechanics, these are things that readers simply expect. It's what you do for them to help guide them through the ideas. Now, what we're looking at as far as the class and as far as argumentative structure specifically, is the open and the close. So do you have a clear claim, purpose, and audience? Do you wrap it up in a way that's satisfying for your readers? Are there clear main points and organization? Is it reason? Do things transition? Do things flow? Do things move from topic to topic? Do you feel like um, you can hear the writer's voice? Those are things that really all of us look for as readers. And um, you all have done a lot of reading in your life, so I know you're good readers and I know you can recognize good writing because of that. So one of the things that you're looking at is the organization, the order and the flow. So let's start here since we were working backwards. Expectation is um, for the top score for three, logical compelling progression of ideas in essay. These are really like just phrases. Clear structure which enhances and showcases the claim and moves the reader through the text. Organization flows so smoothly the reader doesn't notice. Transitions are effective, mature, and graceful throughout the essay. Now when we move into the two, Overall, the paper's logically developed progression of ideas in essay makes sense and moves the reader easily through the essay. Strong transitions exist throughout and add to the essay's coherence, but things are logical, but not lovely. Um, they make sense, but they aren't as smooth as say a three would be. And then for um, the one, this is progression of ideas and essay is awkward yet moves the reader through the text without too much confusion. The writer sometimes uh, lunges ahead too quickly or spends too much time on details that do not matter or maybe doesn't have sufficient details to clarify something. Um, transitions appear sporadically but not equally throughout the essay. So you still see that there is organization, there's reasoning, there's transition and there's an effort at flow. So that three, two, one, that one is still um, a C effort. That's an average effort, that's a passing effort. What is not a passing effort is um, arrangement of essays unclear and illogical. The writing lacks a clear sense of direction, ideas, details, or events seem strung together in a loose or random fashion. 
there's no identifiable internal structure. Readers are have trouble following the ideas and few forced transitions in the essay or no transitions are present. This is what my shitty first drafts look personally. That's what they look like personally. So when we look at the way these things score out, I don't have letter grades. I have those numbers, those um, which could be, you know, 10, 5, 2. It just, they're a bit arbitrary. But what I want you to know is an A is predominantly in the three column. A B is going to have some three um, predominantly in the two. And a C is predominantly here. The um, the D or the failing paper is predominantly here, but things, what I find is usually things overlap. So maybe somebody has really done great work with their citations, their MLA format and their mechanics, but the rest of the writing is really not working very well. Then I would probably, because they're um, dipping over into things, I would give them, you know, perhaps a D. I, um, it's a matter of how much each of these things happen, whether it's B or C. But like I said, y'all clearly know what a D is, and y'all clearly know what an A is. It's, it's that fuzzy space in between that sometimes confuses. So that's the organization. When it comes to main points and supporting evidence, the evidence super important, main points are well developed with supporting details. Reliable, verifiable, credible, and sufficient evidence. That evidence may be from those secondary sources you found, from you know your own observations, from logical um, progression of information and details, perhaps a story that or a narrative that you um, can share from your own experience. In uh, two, the main points are present but lack some of the detail and development, and um, in a three, right? So that, in that three level. And um, evidence is not sufficient to prove the main points. So you've got clear main points, but the evidence is not sufficient. Um, when you're looking at the third column, the ones, main points are not developed, the evidence is weak, but some attempts made and then unclear and the evidence are is entirely lacking. So stating some really great main points without supporting evidence to prove those main points isn't gonna get you um, to your ultimate goal of convincing your audience to accept, at the very least, accept your argument, right? Your goal is to encourage your audience to join you in what you're doing and to hear what you're saying and to believe what you're doing. So up here open introduction close conclusion why am i using that language generally speaking most of you have um, completed high school english classes you have learned the five paragraph essay and you might be in the workforce and used to writing emails and letters and reports and proposals and uh, business documents or technical documents, but not necessarily an academic essay. So um, it is that re reference back to the five paragraph essay. Um, remember when your teachers in high school were teaching you the introduction, three main points in the conclusion restates the introduction. These things are still called introductions and conclusions in college writing, but because this is 101 and a lot of you, um, the only essays you've written have been five paragraph essays, I use the language open and close so that we can kind of broaden the definition. When I say introduction, I'm not talking about a five paragraph essay introduction, I'm talking about a way to open your essay, um, to welcome your readers in. So I've got this five paragraph essay link that, let me see, I don't have a Purdue. Five, five paragraph essay. 
And this talks about, I'm quite sure it is, maybe it's the University of North Carolina. I thought I had the link up. Yes, it's the University of North Carolina um, College Writing Center on the five paragraph essay. And they explain why, that there's nothing wrong with the five paragraph essay. I'm going to drop this link in here. Um, but it talks about why we don't write five paragraph essays in college. Nothing wrong with five paragraph essays. In fact, they're an important structure to help young writers begin to craft an essay. Imagine saying write an essay without any guidelines. Of course people need guidelines when they start a new strategy and a new skill. Now we don't use these those in college because um, they often do a poor job setting up a framework or context. They often lack an argument. They're repetitive. They lack flow. They have a certain structure that just doesn't accomplish the things that we want. And what we want to do is break out of that five paragraph essay structure. That was your starting point. There's nothing wrong with your starting point. Starting points, like I said, are very important. But it's important to also step beyond that and let your writing grow. So this five paragraph essay that you used to do in high school is not what we're doing now. Your essays are gonna find their own unique shape. And so that is why I use the word open and close because it calls attention to the fact that we are working in something different. We're working in a new structure. So let me get this so that you can see it more clearly. Um, so opens or introductions, um, they show the readers who the claim the purpose of the audience is. The open is well developed. So in this first column, the open is well developed, interesting, and establishes the purpose tone, audience claim. Claims clearly stated, arguable, and focused. Remember, your claim has to be arguable. You know, you can't just say chocolate's awesome because we all know that, right? <laughs> That's just fact. Um, open in the second column presents the issues, contains some background information, states the problem, but leaves questions or lacks the interest of a three. Open states the claim and issue, but lacks detail, interest, claim is vague or unclear. And that there is the open doesn't introduce the play paper. The claim weakly states uh, is weakly stated, too broad, or otherwise problematic. Oops, look at that. See, finding typos even as we go. Um, that's why we have to revise, right, and edit. So anyway, sometimes the um, open is absent. Now that is different from having an open that where you just launch right into the essay. So I have some suggestions. The role of the introduction. Introductions and conclusions can be the most difficult parts of, a, of papers to write. Usually when you sit down to respond to an assignment, you have at least some sense of where you're going. You might have chosen a few examples you want to use or have an idea that will help you answer the many in question. Um, these sections, therefore, may not be as hard to write. But it's fine to write them first. But what you might find is you end up having to write them last. I often leave um, the open and just start with my points when I'm free writing and when I'm drafting. Uh, you never get a second chance to make first impression, right? This is the way you invite your reader into your essay. This is the appetizer of the meal that you're going to offer them. But you want them to have, if you look at an essay um, in metaphor as a satisfying meal, you don't want people confused. You don't want people not following. You don't want people, you know, you want people to enjoy. You want people to get something out of it. You want them to feel satisfied in the close of it. But in the open, you are trying to both get their attention and show them what's going to be happening. So there are some effective opens. And here are some examples of ways you can do it. 
an intriguing example, a provocative quotation, a puzzling scenario, a vivid, perhaps unexpected anecdote, a thought-provoking question. And then every so often, maybe you just launch right into things. What I often find is that the way an open works with the close is um, is what's, well, it, it always is the case. The way an open works with a close is going to show your reader the growth that has been achieved in the essay. And I'm going to give you an example of that. Things not to do, okay? Let's not even put in our heads things not to do. Let's just focus on the good strategies that are helpful. So, opens. And then the closes. If we look at the rubric again, the close satisfies readers answering the so what question in some fashion. It's not a simple restatement of the open. Don't, that's the five paragraph essay where you just restate the open. The close shows the growth of the ideas and the argument. Let's take a look at a well done close. You can pull any of the essays that we've used this semester that you've read. Uh, okay, let's read Brent Staples. If you want to get a sense of how to work with an open and a close, pick out some essays that you really like. There's some good essays in our textbook. Um, I've assigned some essays that I think are excellent. You may not have enjoyed all of them, but they all have characteristics of excellent writing. Some of them break a lot of rules, which is kind of fun. Um, but this is an example of an open. My first victim was a woman, white, well-dressed, probably in her early 20s. I came upon her late one evening on a deserted street in Hyde Park. And then he describes with beautiful detail the whole situation. Here he was, youngest black man, um, broad six feet, two inches, bulky military jacket, Within seconds, she disappeared into a cross street. Then he goes in, I was 23 as a, in a graduate student. Where does he close? And on Lady Evening Constitutional's Long Streets Left Traveled by, I employ what has proved to be an excellent tension reducing measure. I whistle melodies from Beethoven and Vivaldi and more popular classical composers, even steely New Yorkers hunching toward nighttime destinations seem to relax and occasionally they even join in the tune. Virtually everybody seems to sense that a mugger wasn't, wouldn't be warbling bright sunny selections from Vivaldi's Four Seasons. It's my equivalent to the cowbell that hikers wear when they know they are in bear country. So we have his first problematic realization that because he's a large black woman, uh, black man, women, um, at night seem afraid of him. Um, he concludes with how he goes about addressing this. He engages in what we call code switching and he engages in a behavior that will change the environment that he is in, change the perceptions of him. But he doesn't um, whistle anything, he whistles Vivaldi. It is his equivalent to a cowbell. Cowbells are what hikers wear to use to scare bears off. So that's an interesting image to consider when in the open, and again, we're sandwiching two different experiences um, on nighttime walks. His initial young man's realization that a large man a large black man um, is intimidating to this white woman um, in that night to this is how I handle it now. So, and he even leaves the image of the bear, the white woman as the bear versus him as the hiker. It's kind of a shift and a twist and an interesting take on the way he approached it in the open. So you can see a tremendous amount of growth and incredible detail. His exquisite detail is it's just beautiful. He um, wrote this essay. I know that a lot of you may not have done your um, 
research on the occasion. He wrote this essay in the 1980s, and it really could be, you know, it sounds like it happened last week, you know, here in Flint. And um, this was first published in Ms. Magazine, which is also where Judy Brady first published her I Want a Wife essay. So that gives you some information about the audience. What was his purpose? He was trying to illustrate both the personal narrative of his experiences as a black man, and he was also um, describing for those um, outside of that experience, those people who are not black men walking in the evening in Chicago, but he is um, describing with beautiful detail uh, the way he navigates space as a black man. Um, he has different considerations, you know, basically due to racism, that he has to um, work with. And his experience within the essay between those two paragraphs plays out why these shifts and why he determined that he was going to do some code switching. So I really love the way that he offers detail. I love the way that you know he's going to be looking at things, but he also brings you in in a way that's surprising. Um, he's going to be looking at the perceptions of black men in public spaces. When I taught this essay probably four years ago, I still remember the student who responded. He was really, um, he was really sad about it because he's like, Ms. Drapo, why are people afraid of me? And it happens that the student was a football player on the University of Michigan's football team, right? So football players team, yeah. He's a football player at U of M. Dude was huge. And I said, you know, Josh, it's, I'm sorry. I know that some people are afraid because you're black. If I saw you in the street, now that I know you, well, first of all, you're huge. So that would make me nervous because I'm not huge. But um, I said, if I ever see you at night in Ann Arbor or anywhere else, I promise I will get out and say hi and not be afraid, you know. I one time actually got to do that. It was three or four months later, I was driving home after a late meeting and I saw him um, walking down the sidewalk to go get some food. And I stopped my car, pulled over, jumped out and said, hey, Josh, hey, Miss Drapo. And, you know, the middle-aged white woman and the um, first year football player at U of M like met on the side of the street, you know, and hugged each other and said hello. So um, this essay points out a reality that is very painful. Um, it's a reality in our country and I'm, <clears throat> it's an important thing to talk about. I wish we could have a conversation in person about this content, but um, hopefully, my sharing my personal story with this essay and with Josh. Um, that that will, um, that will be okay for you. But um, it was just kind of funny because, you know, the victim, you know, there were no victims because once you know one another, everyone, you know, is just happy to see each other. But um, it's important to be aware of how, you know, we impact others in the way we occupy space. This is a beautiful essay. This is beautifully written. I could just carry on and on, and I already have, I apologize. But as you can see, the open to the close, lots of growth. So I am going to just drop this in our notes as an example. I will put that right here. Oops, come on. Again, you've read this, but reading it again, I read it again. Every time I assign it, I read it, and it's um, it's more beautiful each time. He's just an amazing writer. So if we have an introduction, what are we doing? Let's take a look at this and parcel this out. What is our open going to look like? Oops. <laughs> I will add that back in. Okay. All right. 
so we have here the criteria, right? Okay. Well developed, interesting, establishes the purpose, the tone, the audience, and the claim. So the claim, what is your claim? That is your debatable thesis. That is what you're trying to prove. Thesis, purpose. Now with argument, your purpose can have multiple, um, multiple levels. You may be writing your argument to raise awareness that there's an issue. You may be writing your argument just to get people to accept that, hey, that is an issue. I, I accept that. Um, you may be writing your argument to gain agreement, like, hey, I agree with you. Or maybe you're looking to change behavior. An example that I love to share is from a student at Oakland University. We were doing a semester, the theme at the college, at the university that semester was water. Actually, it was the whole year. And so he was doing, he wanted to do some work and talk about um, recycling and how that, you know, was part of water. But what he did with his presentation, so he wrote a paper, then he also did a presentation for his classmates. And he had observed that they all throughout the semester, you know, he, um, they were all aware of it because we had been talking about it as a class issue. Everybody accepted that, you know, recycling is a thing that can have positive outcomes. People even agreed that it was important, but what he noticed is that classmates were not recycling. They would walk out the door with their empty water bottles and they could choose between the trash can and the, the blue recycle bin, just like we have at Mott, and they would drop things in the trash can. And his goal for this presentation was to get them to move their hand four inches to the right and drop it in the recycle bin. And um, it was really interesting to see him talk about that. And what he needed to do was understand his audience in order to get that action, right? In order to accomplish anything in our essays, we really want to understand who our reader is. And so is your audience, you know, Ms. Magazine, like it was for um, Brent Staples? Is it a bunch of other undergraduates who are not recycling? Why do people disagree with you? You know, it's important to understand who they are and why they disagree. There can be multiple reasons why people disagree. So think more about what publication would you want this to be in? Would this be in, I don't know, a local newspaper? Would this be in a newsletter for a school district? Would this be in, um, you know, policy, you know, a policy journal, where do you foresee this being? And then the tone, what mood do you want to create? That also is determined by who you're writing for. If you're writing for parents, then the sorts of examples you offer are going to be different than if you're writing for policymakers or administrators. You're trying to encourage parents to support a certain cause of course of action, say with recess or with college um, costs or with access to college, you know, the early middle college. So all of these things happen in the open and that's a lot to share, but it is the job of an open, which now, you know, <laughs> don't be intimidated. Remember, just go back and see, hey, can I do this? Remember how Frank Staples found that um, vivid moment to open his essay? So with closes, these kind of parallel. What are some ways you can close an essay? Play the so what game, return to the theme or themes in the introduction. That's what Staples did. He kind of sandwiched it, two different descriptions of two different evenings. Synthesize, don't summarize, include a brief summary, but don't repeat what you've already said. Push it further, show us something beyond what is the next step? What does it look like now? Include a provocative insider quote, propose a course of action, point to some broader implications. All of these things are effective. And here is our, so when we look at the close, the close satisfies readers. Answering the so what question is not a simple restatement. The close shows the growth of the ideas and the argument. 
The conclusion summarizes many topics. Some suggestions for change are evident, but the growth of the ideas is not presented fully. It does its job, it's okay, but it's not like lovely, right? <clears throat> Excuse me, the close summarizes main topics, but is repetitive. No suggestions for change and our options are included. So we're not seeing the kind of growth that we want to see as a reader. If we spent 1400 words reading something, we want to land with some fresh knowledge, right? You want to get something from it. And then the close is um, absent, undeveloped, or confusing. So this is the rubric for the assignment. Hopefully this gave you some more information on ways that you can um, work on this project. One thing that I wanna point out in terms of organization is paragraph structures. Some links on developing paragraphs because what I find is when students get to this course, oh, we got bold on it's time to go back and revisit paragraphs. I've got three different links for you. Perhaps one of them will speak to you more than the others. Of course, my University of North Carolina. <laughs> ah, come on. So what is a paragraph? A paragraph is a unit or the building block of an essay. How do you decide what to put in a paragraph? Brainstorming ideas. Your paragraph wants, needs to be unified. It needs to be talking about a single thing. There's a topic sentence and there's a topic that you're addressing in that specific paragraph. It's, paragraphs are generally not enough space to address an entire main point. You look at them as aspects of the main points. You wanna clearly relate it back to the thesis of the claim. You want it to be um, logical. So that's coherent, well-developed, that's the evidence. So let me add that in. But it's usually time by now in 101 to revisit paragraph structures and give it a little thought about what those mean to you. So, so far we have project three, review of the, the fact that you took the plagiarism, there's a sample paper, MLA citations, um and the five paragraph essay why we don't write those in college then there's the rubric about opens i explained why i say opens and closes we looked at brent staples as an example i carried on about brent staples writing and issues of anti-racism and um let me see i have all these links here to make sure we want to make sure you include a title. This is a great little handout from the University of Minnesota that gives you different strategies for brainstorming a title. This would be a fun project to do in class with groups. I thought about having you do, you know, ten, pick 10 of these for a discussion forum but it's a lot more fun in person and it seemed to me that a discussion forum would not be that much fun. So I opted not to do that. We have titles. So some brainstorming about a title because you need to have a title. And your title is not project three. It is not Where is this? <laughs> there you go. It is not any of these questions. These questions were the titles of somebody else's essays. So you need your own title, right? You wanna come up with your own title. And um, so considerations. Then we talked about the open, what's in the open. We talked about closes, um, Brent Staples, and then paragraph structures. And I'm going to say that Perhaps I should make another video with information about, here we go, plagiarism, answering more, the going back and revisiting your questions and citing sources. Um, or we can just go through quickly and talk about citing sources. 
those of you who conferenced with me have seen these notes. But I'm going to drop them in here so everybody has them in one place. Now, why are you citing sources? Now, remember that when we looked at it, you have to cite your sources. Um, plagiarism is pretty zero sum. Either it's cited correctly or it's not. Now, there's a difference between plagiarism as far as like stealing and cheating, and there are the different, you know, the difference is you're in English 101, no one is expecting you to perfectly demonstrate your documentation skills. Your citation skills are growing, you're learning, you will do your best, that is what we ask. Um, if something is incorrect in the way you cite it, then that's a teaching moment, that's a learning moment, and we correct it. If you are in grad school and making the kinds of mistakes that are common in 101, that'd be different, wouldn't it? Think about where you're at, don't panic, okay? Whether it's intentional, unintentional, it's still plagiarism, but in this classroom, unintentional is still defined as unintentional. Um, Right here, the source material is smoothly integrated into the text. All sources are accurately de um, documented in text and on references page. So on the works cited page, this references are the, is the name of a page in APA format. Source materials used, all sources are accurately do documented, but if you are not in the desired format, some sources lack credibility. Um, sources material is used, but integration may be awkward. Effort is made to document, but citations are incorrect. And then insufficient supporting material is included and sources are not accurately documented. So you see throughout this, support, 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 support. See, we had evidence up here. And then the mechanics. But if we look at why you're citing, the writer's job is to be sure the reader knows when someone else's idea begins and ends. Is it someone else's idea? Then please make it clear. The reason you do this is to build support within your argument, to build your credibility as a writer, and to build those logical connections. The things we cite, C-I-T-E, are quotes, so the exact words, and I really encourage you to use sections of sentences, not whole paragraphs. Um, the essential element that you can't replicate by paraphrasing. Paraphrasing is restating in your own words and kind of maintain the size, like restate a sentence using that sentence um, structure and the size. It's easier to make things fit into your essay if you paraphrase, right? Summary is reducing the size of an entire article or section so that it fits. When you add stuff from to your writing, right, the stuff being other people's content, other people's ideas, other people's words, you need to introduce it. The ideas into the essay become an intro. Your ideas and um, you can use a signal phrase or logic to connect things. You need to state the information. So first you're gonna introduce it. Here comes someone else's stuff. Then you're gonna state it. Then you're gonna cite it. And then you're gonna interpret it. Now what that means is Maybe you're going to use a signal phrase. Here's my example. Smith states the temperature is 70 degrees Fahrenheit. That's on page four. So we have a signal phrase because we know the author and we have a location. This takes us um, to the interpretation section, right? What does it mean to interpret? If you put this in your paper, people are gonna think different things depending upon their own experience. Some people might think 70 degrees is really cold in a classroom. Some people might think it's really hot for a classroom. Some people might think it's just the right temperature for them to learn. If you don't tell them why you included that information, if you don't explain somehow how it fits, your readers are gonna do the work for you and they may not do it the way you would like for them to do it. Um, your experience is what's going on here. Your reasoned experience. Your claim is your informed opinion and you are using research and evidence to support that informed opinion. You are using logic to express it and you are, from all of the conferences I've seen and the peer reviews doing an awesome job, 
longer video than usual and I do wish that we had some engagement, right? We can talk to each other <laughs> um, during these, but I'm going to post this ter terrible video anyway. I have the links for you and I will see you on Canvas. <laughs>